All right, I want to introduce you to the poetry of Robinson Jeffers. Uh, Jeffers was Joseph Campbell's favorite poet, which is one of the reasons why I read him uh, back in, uh, as soon as I graduated from college, um, and his work absolutely blew me away. I think he is very possibly the most underrated poet in America, still to this day. He did make the cover of Time magazine back in the 1930s, astonishingly. Imagine a poet making the cover of Time magazine nowadays. That's a physical impossibility. Um, and the interesting thing about him is, so he went out to Big Sur and then up to, uh, I think, Carmel, Monterey, that whole area, before it was populated back in the 1920s, or perhaps a decade earlier even than that. And he built himself a stone house there. You can see it in the, in the picture. Uh, built himself a stone house and um, he had a wife and two kids and he just spent the, his entire life there contemplating the ocean. Um, in many ways he's like the Homer of William Irma Thompson's cultural ecology of the Pacific shift in which Thompson talked about how the Pacific ba uh, Basin becomes the, n the new Mediterranean Basin um, with electronics as the primary technology, but um, Jeffers was like Spengler, and I think Oswald Spengler, if Spengler had been a poet, he would have been Robinson Jeffers. Jeffers uh, did not trust civilization. Um, he knew that it was transient. He knew that it would fall apart, um, and he just sort of sat out there like a hermit contemplating uh, the declining civilization of the West. So let's take a look at his poetry here. Um, the first poem is called Faith. Answer wise bees are a gang of wolves, worked together by instinct, but man needs lies. Man, his admired and more complex mind, needs lies to bind the body of his people together, make peace in the state, and maintain power. These lies are called a faith, and their formulation we call a creed, and the faithful flourish. They conquer nature and their enemies, they win security. Then proud and secure, they will go a whoring with that impractical luxury, the love of truth. It tries all things. Alas, the poor lies. The faith, like a morning mist burnt by the sun. Thus, the great wave of a civilization loses its forming soul, falls apart, and founders. Yet I believe that truth is more beautiful than all the lies, and God than all the false gods. Then we must leave it to the humble and the ignorant to invent the frame of faith that will form the future. It was not for the Romans to produce Christ. It was not for Lucretius to prophesy him, nor Pilate to follow him. Or could we change at last and choose truth? Uh, and the second poem here is called The Sirens. Perhaps we desire death, or why is poison so sweet? Why do the little sirens make kindlier music? For a man caught in the net of the world between newscast and work desk, the little chirping sirens, alcohol, amusement, opiates, and carefully sterilized lust than the angels of life. Really, it is rather strange, for the angels have all the power on their side, all the importance. Men turn away from them, preferring, preferring their own vulgar inventions, the little trivial sirens. Here is another sign that the age needs renewal. All right, and this poem... Uh, is a little bit longer. It's about a descent into the underworld to encounter the dead. Come, little birds, it's called. I paid the woman uh, what she asked and followed her down to the waterside, and her two sons came down behind us. One of them brought a spade. The other led the black calf and tied him up short to a sycamore trunk over the stream bank. It was near the foot of the mountains where the Sur River pours from its gorge, foaming among great stones, and evening had come, but the light was still clear. The old woman brought us to a tongue of grass land under the stream bank. One of her boys gathered dry sticks for a fire. The other cleared and repaired a short, shallow trench that scored the earth there. Then they heaped up the sticks and made yellow flame, about ten feet from the trench. On the north side, right against the water, the woman sat opposite the fire and facing it, gazing northward, her back against a big stone. She closed her eyes and hummed tuneless music, nodding her vulturine head to the dull rhythm. 
through which one heard the fire snoring and the river flowing and the surf on the shore of the hill. After some time she widened her eyes, and their sight was rolled up under her forehead. I saw the firelight flicker on the blank whites. She raised her arms and cried out in a loud voice. Instantly her two boys went up and fetched the black calf, though he plunged and struggled. They tied his hind feet with a tight knot and passed the bite of the rope over a sycamore bough that hung above the stream and the head of the trench. They tugged his hind feet up to it so that he fell on the knees of his forelegs over the trench head. Then one of the two young men sheared the calf's throat with a sharp knife, holding him by one ear, the other by an ear and the nostrils, and the blood spouted into the furrow. The woman, her body twitching convulsively, "'Come, little birds,' she screamed through her tightened throat like a strangling person. "'Put on the life. Here's the blood. Come, you gray birds.' By this time, deep night had come, and the fire down to red coals, there was a murmur along the stream side as if a sea wind were moving through the dark forest. Then I saw dimly in the light of the coals the stream that climbed the cold air from the hot blood and hung stagnant above the trench, stirred as if persons were stooping through it and stirring it, and distant whispers began to hiss in the trench, and gray shapes moved. One said, Why we thin? Out of my way, you dregs. Another answered, Stand back, you've had your turn. These were no doubt the souls of the dead. That dark-eyed woman had promised would come and tell me what I had to know. They looked rather like, like star-like sheep that were driven through the dust all day, and deep night has come. They huddle at a bend of the lane, scared by the dogs, gray and exhausted. And if one goes un under, the others trample him. One of the old woman's boys gradually revived the spent fire with dry leaves and twigs, so that the light increased imperceptibly. Yet many of that whispering flock were frightened away. Those that remained, several still greedy, cowered over the blood trench, others erect, wavered like long, pale water weeds. I went near them. They sighed and whispered, leaning away from me like rooted water weeds. I said, if you are the souls of the dead and this old woman's trance and the warm blood make you able to answer, and I was about to say, then tell me what death is like. Is it sleep or waking, captivity or freedom, dreams or reality? But they, hearing my thought, whispered, we know, we know, we know, wavering like water weeds. Then one leaned toward me saying, tell my mother. What? I said. Tell her I was well enough before that old buzzard waked me. I died in the base hospital. Another of the forms crossed him and said, God curse every man that makes war or plans it. This was in 1920, about two years after the armistice. God curse every congressman that voted it. God curse Wilson, his face like an axe, passed between my eyes and the fire, and he entered the darkness beyond the light rim. I asked the other, what is your mother's name? But he could not answer, but only stared at me. I said, does she live on the coast or in Monterey? He stared at me and struck his forehead and stood aside. Others came, came towards me. Two of them seemed to be women. But now I saw a known form, tall, gaunt, gray-haired, and the shoulders so stooped they appeared like a hump. He leaned to the fire, warming his gray old hands. I avoided the other shapes of the dead and went to him. My heart was shaking and my eyes wet. Father, I said. He answered clearly, is that you, Robin? I said, Father, forgive me. I dishonored and wasted all your hopes of me, one by one. Yet I loved you well. He smiled calmly and answered, I suppose hope is a folly. We often learn that before we die. We learn, he said, nothing afterwards. Then I was silent and breathed and asked, Is it asleep? With a dream sometimes, but far too bloodless to grieve, he said, or gladden the dreamer. And soon I conjecture even this pin's weight an echo of consciousness that makes me speak to you will dissolve in the stream. He smiled and rubbed his gray hands together and said, Amen. If you come to Endor again, I shall not be present. Then I wished to tell him our little news, that his name would continue in the world, for we had two sons now, and that my mother and my brother were well, and also the outcome of the Great War, because he had died in its fifth month. He was patient and let me speak, but clearly not cared at all. Meanwhile, the woman had been groaning in her trance. I noticed the shapes of the dead changed with her breathing. When she drew back breath, they became stronger. When her breath was delayed, they grew faint and vague. 
But now she became exhausted. Her breathing was like a death rattle with terrifying pauses between the gasps. One of her boys ran to restore her. The other heaped the fire high and the pale dead were fleeing away. But a certain one of them came running toward me, slender and naked. I saw the firelight glitter on her, on her bare thighs. She said, I am Tamar Caldwell from Lobos. Write my story. Tell them I have my desire. She passed me and went like a lamp through the dark wood. This was all. The young men carried their mother up to the cabin. I was left alone and stayed by the fire all night, studying what I had heard and seen, until yellow dawn stood over the mountain. This was all? I thought not. I thought these decaying shadows and echoes of personality are only a byplay. They are not the spirit that we see in one love, or in saint or hero shining through flesh. And I have seen it shine from a mountain through rock and even from an old tree through the tough bark. The spirit, to call it so, what else could I call it, is not a personal quality and not mortal. It comes and goes, never dies. It is not to be found in death. Dredge not the shadow world. The dead had no news for us. We have for them, but they do not care. Peace to them. Interesting take on conversing with the dead. It doesn't exactly match my experiences where the dead have a lot of news and a lot of things to say and a lot of things to communicate. Um, but it's an interesting sort of imagination. Okay, so the next poem is called Watch the Lights Fade. Gray steel, cloud shadow stained, the ocean takes the last lights of evening. Loud is the voice in the foam lead color, and flood tide devours the sands. Here stand like an old stone, and watch the lights fade, and hear the sea's voice. Hate and despair take Europe and Asia, and the sea wind blows cold. Night comes, night will claim all. The world is not changed, only more naked. The strong struggle for power, and the weak warm their poor hearts with hate. Night comes. Come into the house. Try around the dial for a late newscast. These others are America's voices. Naive and powerful. Spurious. Doom-touched. How soon? Four years or forty? Why should an old stone pick at the future? Stand on your shore, old stone. Be still while the sea wind salts your head white. Again there, that idea uh, of the decline of civilization. This one's one of my favorites. Diagram. Look, there are two curves in the air. The air that man's fate breathes, there is the rise and fall of the Christian culture complex that broke its dawn cloud 15 centuries ago, and now past noon drifts to decline. And there's the yet vaster curve, but mostly in the future, of the age that began at Kitty Hawk within one's lifetime. The first of these curves, passing its noon, and the second orient, all in one's little lifetime make it seem pivotal. Truly the time is marked by insane splendors and agonies. But watch when the two curves cross. You children not too far away down the hawk's nightmare future. You will see monsters. Real and half real. It was time to find a new world. Who was sent forth? Columbus. That is, the dove. Noah's dove over wide waters. It was time, men having so long so vainly envied the birds, it was time to realize that ancient dream. And who were appointed? Two brothers, surnamed Wright, that's maker, artificer, launched their contrivance where? On the field of the hawk, kitty hawk, the mewing hawk. These are the two great turnings in a thousand years. You notice how the names mark them? Do you see Myth leaning tall from her darkness over the shoulder of history? guiding the hand that writes. A dove discovers new lands. A legendary artificer, doubled to symbolize importance, invents the plane. Or again, consider the dates of the earlier World War. It became World War the day America entered it. What was that day? A most appropriate day, a so-called Good Friday, the day of the death of Christ. And then it ended, not quite too late, and its armistice is dated the 11th hour, Underscored by eleventh day and month, a grim bit of humor, trivial but ominous. And now we return to complete the twelfth. The man who has chosen to crack the iron shell of Europe, what is his name? Iron Hewer. That is to say, Eisenhower. There seems to be something intentional in these coincidences. Perhaps they are a token that what makes history is not the actors, 
Men's minds and clashing causes are not the cause. The play, as Hardy, Tolstoy, Sophocles knew, is authored outside the scene. Invisible wires are pulled. The passionate puppets gesticulate. Napoleon, Oedipus, and Hitler perform their preformed agonies. But now consider something not human. Here at the coast hills at Sobrens Creek, Seamouth, steep wedges and cones of granite, thin-skinned with grass, their feet are deep in the flood-tide ocean, dark, heavy, and still, calm in this trough between two storms. Their heads are against the dark, heavy sky. No life is visible but the bright grass and a gang of wild pigs, huddled from flank to flank, flowing up a swale on the far slope. And that one eagle, wheeling and rocking, high and alone against the cloud lid. Here are no trivial artist signatures, no puppet play, no pretense of free will. This is first-class reality. The human affair is half real, part myth, part artwork. This is in earnest. I conclude that men should play the parts assigned them and do it bravely, emulating the nobility of nature, but well in mind that their play is a play. It is serious, but not important. What's done in earnest is done outside it. So he didn't have any kind of faith whatsoever in human nature. For him... The only nature that mattered was the nature that he was living in and surrounded with the beauty uh, every day of the ocean and the hawks and the wild pigs and so forth. Um, let's see, a couple more here. Original sin. The man-brained and man-handed ground ape. Physically the most repulsive of all hot-blooded animals up to that time of the world, they had dug a pitfall and caught a mammoth. But how could their sticks and stones reach the life in that hide? They danced around the pit, shrieking with ape excitement, flinging sharp flints in vain, and the stench of their bodies stained the white air of dawn. But presently one of them remembered the yellow dancer, wood-eating fire, that guards the cave mouth. He ran and fetched him, and others gathered sticks at the wood's edge. They made a blaze and pushed it into the pit, and they fed it high around the mired sides of their huge prey. They watched the long, hairy trunk waver over the stifle, trumpeting pain and they were happy. Meanwhile, the intense color and nobility of sunrise, rose and gold and amber flowed up the sky. Wet rocks were shining, a little wind stirred the leaves of the forest, and the marsh flag flowers, the soft valley between the low hills, became as beautiful as the sky, while in its midst, hour after hour, the happy hunters roasted their living meat slowly to death. These are the people. This is the human dawn. As for me, I would rather be a worm and a wild apple than a son of man. But we are what we are, and we might remember not to hate any person for all are vicious, and not be astonished at any evil, all are deserved, and not fear death, it is the only way to be cleansed. So a very negative view of uh, human nature as fundamentally corrupt. Um, and here, this is the last poem I want to read. Um, it's untitled, and it was one of the last poems that he wrote, uh, and it's a kind of a cre his version of a creation myth. The unformed volcanic earth, a female thing, furiously following with the other planets, their lord the sun. Her body is molten metal, pressed rigid by its own mass. Her beautiful skin, basalt and granite, and the lighter elements swam to the top. She was like a mare in her heat, eyeing the stallion, screaming for life in the, in the womb. Her atmosphere was the breath of her passion, not the blithe air men breathe in love, but marsh gas, ammonia, sulfured hydrogen, such poison as our remembering bodies return to when they die and decay and the end of life meets its beginning. The sun heard her and stirred her thick air with fierce lightnings and flagellations of germinal power, building impossible molecules, amino acids and flashy, unstable proteins. Thence life was born, its nitrogen from ammonia, carbon from methane, water from the cloud, and salts from the young seas. It dribbled down into the primal ocean like a babe's urine soaking the cloth. Heavily built protein molecules chemically growing, bursting apart as the tensions in the inordinate molecule become unbearable. That is to say, growing and reproducing themselves, a virus on the warm ocean. Time and the world changed. The proteins were no longer created. The ammoniac atmosphere in the great storms no more. This virus now must labor to, ma to maintain itself. It clung together into bundles of life, which we call cells, with microscopic walls enclosing themselves against the world. 
But why would life maintain itself, being nothing but a dirty scum on the sea, dropped from foul air? Could it perhaps perceive glories to come? Could it foresee that cellular life would make the mountain forest and the eagle dawning, monstrously beautiful, wings, eyes, and claws, dawning over the rock ridge? And the passionate human intelligence straining its limits, striving to understand itself and the universe to the last galaxy. Flamantia minia mundi, Lucretius wrote, alliterating like a Saxon, all those M's mean majesty. The flaming world walls, far-flung fortifications of being against not being. For after a time, the cells of life bound themselves into clans, a multitude of cells, to make one being, as the molecules before had made of many one cell. Meanwhile, they had invented chlorophyll and ate sunlight, cradled in peace on the warm waves. But certain assassins among them discovered that it was easier to eat flesh than feed on lean air and sunlight. Thence the animals, greedy mouths and guts, life robbing life, grew from the plants. And as the ocean ebbed and flowed, many plants and animals were stranded in the great marshes along the shore, where many died and some lived. From these grew all land life, plants, beasts, and men, the mountain forests, and the mind of Aeschylus, and the mouse in the wall. What is this thing called life? But I believe that the earth and stars too, and the whole glittering universe, and rocks on the mountain have life, only we do not call it so. I speak of the life that oxidizes fats and proteins and carbohydrates to live on, and from that chemical energy makes pleasure and pain, wonder, love, adoration, hatred, and terror. How do these things grow from a chemical reaction? I think they were here already. I think the rocks and the earth and the other planets and the stars and galaxies have their various consciousness. All things are conscious. But the nerves of an animal, the nerves and brain bring it to focus. The nerves and brain are like a burning glass to concentrate the heat and make it catch fire. It seems to us martyrs hotter than the blazing hearth from which it came. So we scream and laugh, clamorous animals born howling to die groaning. The old stones in the dooryard prefer silence. But those in all things have their own awareness, as the cells of a man have. They feel and feed and influence each other, each unto all, like the cells of a man's body making one being. They make one being, one consciousness, one life, one God. But whence came the race of man? I will make a guess. A change of climate killed the great northern forests, forcing the man-like apes down from their trees. They starved up there. They had been secure up there, but famine is no security. Among the withered branches blew famine. They had to go down to the earth where green still grew and small meats might be gleaned. But there the great flesh eaters, tiger and panther and the horrible fumbling bear, and endless wolf packs made life a dream of death. Therefore man has those dreams and kills out of pure terror. Therefore man walks erect, forever alerted. As the bear rises to fight, so man does always. Therefore he invented fire and flint weapons in his desperate need. Therefore he is cruel and bloody-handed and quick-witted, having survived against all odds. Never blame the man. His hard-pressed ancestors formed him. The other anthropoid apes were safe in the great southern rainforest and hardly changed in a million years. But the race of man was made by shock and agony. Therefore they invented the song called Language to celebrate their survival and record their deeds. And therefore the deeds they celebrate, Achilles raging in the flame of the south, Baltic Beowulf like a fog-blinded she-bear, sea-bear, prowling the blasted fenland in the bleak twilight to the black water, are cruel and bloody. Epic drama and history, Jesus and Judas, Genghis, Julius Caesar, no great poem without the blood splash. They're a little lower than the angels, as someone said, blood-snuffing rats. But never blame them. A wound was made in the brain when life became too hard and has never healed. It is there that they learn trembling religion and blood sacrifice. It is there that they learn to butcher beasts and to slaughter men and hate the world. The great religions of love and kindness may conceal that, not change it. They are not primary, but reactions against the hate, as the eye after feeding on a red sunfall will see green sun. The human race is one of God's sense organs, immoderately alerted to feel good and evil and pain and pleasure. It is a nerve ending like eye, ear, taste buds, hardly able to endure the nauseous draft. It is a, it is a sensory organ of God's. 
as Titan mooded Lear or Prometheus revealed to their audience extremes of pain and passion they will never find in their own lives. But through the poems as sense organs, they feel and know them. So the exaltations and agonies of beasts and men are sense organs of God. And on other globes throughout the universe, much greater nerve endings enrich the consciousness of the one being who is all that exists. This is man's mission, to find and feel. All animal experience is a part of God's life. He would be balanced to neutral as a rock on the shore, but the red sunset waves of life's passions fling over him. Slowly, perhaps, man may grow into it. Do you think so? This villainous king of beasts? This deformed ape? He has mind and imagination. He might go far and end in honor. The hawks are more heroic, but man has a steeper mind. Huge pits of darkness, high peaks of light. You may calculate a comet's orbit or the dive of a hawk, but not a man's mind. All right, that's an introduction to the great poetry of one of my favorite poets, uh, Robinson Jeffers, who has been overlooked. Um, but um, if you want to read more of him, uh, just order his books from Amazon.